Well, welcome to our Wednesday morning service. For those not from this church and who are watching online, my name is Pastor Chris Guys, and I'm filling in uh, this week for uh, Reverend Johnson, who is having a well-deserved break from uh, preaching. And I've titled my message this morning, Two Advents, One Celebration. But before we get into that, let's begin in prayer. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all our generations. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You brought us into being. You turn us back into dust, saying, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or like a watch in the night. And so we remember this eternal truth, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Okay, I'd like to invite Brother Ben to come up and bring us today's reading. I'll get him to actually announce the reading and tell you what it is. Thank you, Ben. Morning, everyone, and it's another wonderful Wednesday where we get to hear a, a second uh, message for the week. Uh, once again, great to have Chris here, uh, hearing his message. I know his message on Sunday was pretty awesome, so if you get a chance and haven't watched it, check it out. It's really good. Uh, this week's message is scripture verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and it's a whole lot. To the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but with power with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. We became you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Acacia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Acacia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. All right, that's a great bit of, bit of scripture and it's time to get Chris back and get him to share the message for this week and can't wait. Let's get him back. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you, Ben, for bringing us the word of God. So again, I've titled my uh, message, Two Advents, Two Advents, One Celebration. Now, in the years leading up to the arrival of the Son of God, the nation of Israel longed for the deliverance from the hardship that they were facing. They longed for a leader to free them from tyranny. And from the pages of Holy Scripture, they knew the story really well, that God would send to them a mighty warrior, the Messiah. But they never expected the reality of a defenseless child. In Isaiah 9, speaking of the Messiah, it was said that he would bring light out of darkness, that he would shatter the yoke imposed by Israel's enemies, that the government would be on his shoulders and that he would reign supreme over his people. Now, they simply did not see or understand what the prophet Micah wrote concerning this Messiah, that he would arrive on the world scene as an infant born in Bethlehem. 
They simply did not see or understand another of Isaiah's prophecies found in chapter 53, that this Messiah would bear a criminal's cross and die a cruel and ignoble death. And how could this possibly be reconciled with the many other prophecies that Messiah would take the throne of his father, David? Everyone knew that Messiah kings are to conquer and to reign, but they do not die. So this perplexed them. Now, over 2,000 years later, we all know about the ignominious and unconventional arrival of Jesus. We rehearse this every single Advent season. Each year we celebrate a child's birth, but do we also celebrate the arrival of the eternal king, the one who spoke creation into existence? You know, remember the wise men? They came to worship a king. Today I want to rehearse with you some of the astounding facts about a small church and about Jesus from the, Apostles, uh, from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Now this letter is, is, is most probably Paul's earliest New Testament writing that we have on record. So let's set the scene a little. Now each chapter in Paul's letter is absolutely replete. It's alive with vibrant truth, especially relevant to young believers, but which this church was. The great doctrines of salvation by grace divine election, principles of effective Christian testimony, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, divine judgment, and the joy and the peace of fellowship with Christ. These are all dominant themes in this book. Now, Thessaloniki in the time of Paul was a, was a, was a thriving commercial town, and it was a stride in a, port, in a very important trade route. It had been founded previously in 316 BC by Cassander. He was the king of Macedonia who named it in honour of his, his wife, Thessaloniki, the half-sister, in fact, of the famous Alexander the Great. And so like Ruth and Esther in the Old Testament, the Thessalonian letters uh, trace their name to a famous woman. Now, when the Apostle Paul, accompanied by Silas and Timothy, entered Thessaloniki, it was, the, it was probably the first time ever that, uh, the, that the gospel had been uh, given testimony to uh, in that area. And indeed, Acts 17 records the amazing result of their ministry in that area of less than one month. Just one month, less than a month. In those few short weeks, a small group of Thessalonians came to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Now, persecution broke out almost immediately and forced Paul and his companions to leave after ministering for just three consecutive Sabbaths. Sometime later, after having heard of their continuing faithfulness to Jesus Christ, in the midst of persecution, Paul sent them the first of his letters, the letters that we just read from, in order to encourage them and to remind them of his love and his faithful prayers for them. Now, the richness of Paul's teaching is really evident if you study his letters, and I would definitely encourage you to do so. Though the Thessalonians were young Christians uh, with less than a year of Christian experience, nonetheless, they were familiar with the great and deep truths of the Christian faith. They knew about salvation. They knew about sanctification. They knew about assurance. They knew about the Trinity. They knew about the nature of man. They knew about the resurrection. And they knew about the day of the Lord. So understand that the context of what I'm trying to address here uh, this morning is focused on Christ as Messiah King. And we also need to understand that the Christians to whom this letter was addressed, we need to remember they had no New Testament. No New Testament whatsoever other than perhaps this letter from Paul and maybe a few other fragments that might have been circulating. It is even doubtful that they had significant portions of the Old Testament. So they were immature Christians facing many trials, many difficulties, and it is with this in view that Paul is writing them this letter of comfort, of exhortation, of instruction. But importantly, in the context of my focus today, is a remarkable feature of Paul's letters, this particular letter. In every single chapter of, of First Thessalonians, the theme of the coming of the Lord is prominent. 
and I believe this is profoundly significant. As I mentioned earlier, every year we celebrate the birth of the Christ child. But generally speaking, we don't give a whole lot of attention or emphasis to the arrival of the eternal king. Not at this time of year. But they must be taken together. They cannot be separated. Christ, remember, did, did not come as an infant into the world in order to remain an infant. Right? That lovely sentiment on Hall, Hallmark cars that we see over and over again as each year passes by. We have to remember that Christ the child grew up. He grew up to be a man and more than a man, he became the God man and he came as a king. And that fact has yet to be fully realized in our existential reality. Therefore, we, when we rehearse Christ's first advent, we must pair it with the expectation of his second advent. They go together. Now, why do I say that? Well, for all the reasons that I explained above, or that I mentioned above, but also because of a problem. And what problem is that, you might ask? I'm glad you asked. A problem with prophecy, which is by its very nature telescopic in its breadth. It's as if the Old Testament prophets, through the power of God's Spirit, they peered into the future, as it were, through a telescope, looking for Messiah. And what they could see were the mountains, representing the major events of the future. Now, if, if you've ever looked through a telescope, and many of us have, you realise that everything is compressed. The mountains will appear as though they are stacked up on top of one another, right? And so the prophets saw these messianic events in their future, all jammed up one upon another, and they had no clue that the distance between them representing the passing of time was considerably larger than their particular perspective could appreciate. Not only that, but they could not see the valleys in between those mountains. They were simply just not visible. So remember that up to the time of Christ's first advent and for several decades after that, the Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah being telescoped as they were made it appear to them as though Christ's arrival into the world as a child and his conquering the world as a warrior king and his setting up of the messianic kingdom were all part of one grand event. And in God's timing, we could say that in a sense they are. But we now know here in the 21st century that these events lie over 2,000 years apart and that the valley that lies in between these two mountain-like events is the church age whose record spans from the New Testament book of Acts and all the way through to Revelation chapter 4. Now, I mentioned earlier one of the significant features of the Thessalonian uh, letters is that in every chapter, the theme of the coming of the Lord is prominent. And this was very, very significant to this young church facing strident persecution. And it should also be significant to us who here at the end of this church age are increasingly facing persecution. So let's pick up an example uh, of this from the letter itself. I'm just going to recap a little bit of what Ben read to us earlier from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and just the last couple of verses 9 and 10. For they themselves report about us what sort of welcome we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10, and to await his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, the one who delivers us from the coming wrath. So did you catch that? Did you see what's happening there? In verse 10, Paul is reminding the believers in Thessaloniki that they had not only turned from God, uh, turned, sorry, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, which was a present work, but they also had a new hope for the future, which was, as the scripture says, to wait for his son from heaven. To wait for his son from heaven. The word wait here is in the present tense. So they had turned to God in one act, 
but there remained this constant day-by-day -day expectations. In other words, they were constantly looking for the return of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ, his coming for his saints. You know, I think about this and I wonder, I wonder how many Christians living today also live with the same level of expectation. And then verse 10 closes with the reminder that the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is coming, the one whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, the Saviour, delivers us from the coming wrath. You know, it's amazing, really. In this one short passage, there are gathered here the great doctrines of one, the second coming of Jesus Christ, as witnessed in the words, waiting for his son from heaven. Two, the resurrection of Christ, as witnessed in the, in the passage which says, whom he raised from the dead. And three, the salvation that Christ wrought in his first coming when he died on the cross, witnessed by the part that says, which delivers us from the wrath to come. And you might ask, what wrath? I never heard about that. What, what wrath are you talking about? Well, did you know that wrath is coming? No, I hope, I hope you've heard about it because it's coming. The closing chapter of 1 Thessalonians brings this very much into sharp view. There is a day of judgment coming and soon. There is a time when God is going to judge this sinful world, but Christ on the cross delivered us from the wrath to come. That is, he delivers anyone, everyone who will trust in him, everyone who will receive him as personal saviour. Now these Thessalonians who lived so long ago had come into the glorious truth that Christ had died for them. They were delivered from the wrath to come. For them, the coming of the Lord was a glorious event to which they could look forward to with keen anticipation and with hearts that were filled with expectation. I wonder, what do our hearts look like? Are they filled with that kind of expectation, that kind of hope? There is, you know, there is so much that we haven't yet covered and we just simply, unfortunately, don't have the time. When I was thinking about this sermon, I was thinking about going through the entire book of Thessalonians. Well, that was just not going to work. I got to the end of chapter 1 and I figured I'm done for time. But, you know, I want you to realise here in just this first chapter of First. Thessalonians lies an incredible challenge to every thinking believer in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Here's the challenge. Do people see in us a firm assurance of our salvation? Do they see in our lives the evidence that the word of God has come in power, that we have been transformed, that we have been made followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they see that we exercise our faith even in the midst of persecution, of affliction, that we have the evidence of the joy of the Holy Spirit and a transformed life so that our testimony is talked about within the communities in which we live and work? You know, is that true of us? And is it true of us like the Thessalonians that there is a living hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same one who loved us, who died for our sins, that he might deliver us from the wrath to come and who was raised victorious over the grave. You see, this letter was written many, many years ago to Christians, to Christians who have long since died, who have left this mortal life, but the truth of this letter continues, it remains, it goes on. So I want to plead with you, I want to ask you, please, mark this Advent season with what is perhaps a strong point of difference to the way you've done it in previous years. Realise that in Christ's first coming is the assurance and the promise of his second coming. They go hand in hand together. They cannot be separated. And so may the truth of this realisation, this truth, not only live within the living and, and uh, the written words, the written pages of the written word of God, but may it also bring us hope and may it be manifested in our hearts 
and in our daily living. Let's pray. We, we will exalt you, our God and our King. We will bless your name forever and ever. We have called to you in our distress and you have answered us. From the depths of the grave we have called for help and you have heard our voice. And so we thank you, God. We will exalt you and we will rejoice in the God of our salvation. Thank you for the hope that we have received in Christ our King. He is our strength and he makes our feet like those of a deer and enables us to ascend the heights. And so we are encouraged with an abiding hope. Maranatha, Lord. Amen. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the message this morning and that you will all have a wonderful week. I pray that you will keep safe and more so I pray that you will rest in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to leave you with this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.